We'll continue in the book of Titus, and if you remember, if you were with us, we've already gone through verses 1 through 6, and we've ended up in verse 7. And it's amazing when we remember what we have studied in the first six verses of this letter that Paul wrote to Titus. You remember that Paul, in the beginning of this letter, and if you see right behind me in that little island there of Crete, is where Paul sent this letter to, to this young minister. And he gave him a commandment. He told him, he said, I want you to organize the churches and set elders or set pastors in those local churches. And Paul told him that he was going to do this, but that there was requirements of those men that he was to choose to be pastors of those local churches. And sometimes we read this letter and we think that it's just talking about ministry. I'm not a pastor or haven't been called into the ministry. It doesn't apply to me, but the Bible applies to all of us and everything that we read. And as we read the book of Titus, we're going to see that many of these requirements or qualities or characteristics that must be found in a bishop or an elder or a pastor are also things that must be found in you and I that profess Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's very important. So we learn how Paul presented himself at the beginning of Titus. Remember in verse 1, he called himself a servant of God. He didn't present himself as an apostle or a bishop or a great leader. Paul simply said, I am a servant of God. Beautiful. When we see how Paul starts this out. What does he show us here? The true example of what true leadership looks like. What does it look like? Servanthood leadership. Number two, we learned about the commitment that Paul desired to impart on Titus. And all of us, as we read this concerning the message of the gospel. Third, we learned that Paul told Titus not to be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus. He said, don't be ashamed of him. Continue in what you've learned in Christ. And fourth, we learned the qualities that must exist in a man that has been called to be a bishop in God's church. The importance behind not just his spiritual life. Because remember, this is not just about us being here in the four walls on Sunday. Our our true testimony begins outside of these four walls. And he's telling him that it's not just about that, but it is the behavior within the church and outside of the church that we should be concerned with. Not just in leadership, but you and I as followers of Christ. Now, if you go with me to verse 7, we're going to look at verse 7 here. We'll break verse 7 down into little pieces, and we'll find out exactly what Paul is trying to tell us in verse 7. Paul begins by once again using the same word he used in verse 6, the word blameless. And he says, and he starts, and he says, for a bishop, so in other words, an elder or a leader or a pastor must be blameless. Does that mean that he's going to be perfect? No. Does that mean that you and I are perfect? No. But it's teaching us that Paul urges that all individuals, all leadership, those holding high positions in the church are to live lives according to God's will. What is this implying? That they're to serve as role models for those around us. They're supposed to serve as acceptable good character. So when Paul is saying a bishop was the blameless, he's trying to say, hey, that man that has been chosen for that job must be a man that is a role model to all those around him, not just in the church. Not only that, but he also exemplifies good character. And we'll see how this applies to each and every one of us here today. So he's a role model, he's a good character, and he knows how to conduct himself in God's house, and outside of the building known as the local church. He knows how to conduct himself in business, in personal life, in communication, in the community, with his neighbors, and with his family. Now, thereby doing this, he's doing what? He's upholding the name of Christ. And at the same time, avoiding any behavior that could bring shame, not just to Christ, but to himself. So Paul is telling again, Titus, he said, look, Titus, 
I have a job for you to do. I've left you in the island of Crete for this reason. Go and choose pastors and organize the local churches, but not just any pastor. Choose men of integrity. Choose men that are blameless. Choose men that he's saying here have good behavior, exemplify good character and conduct outside of the church walls. Somebody that's going to glorify Jesus. Now, he uses the word blameless here again, and we see it in verse 6. Remember, verse 6, it starts out by saying, if any be blameless. And then he gives us the husband of one wife, and we've talked about this, of being faithful, his children. And the reason is that quality is so important that an overseer serves as a steward of God. A pastor serves as a steward of God. And you and I are also stewards of God. And what does that mean? We are, like we, we administer God's word daily, not just on Sundays. So if damage, this can cause the leadership to hurt. It can cause damage to the church and as a whole bring a reproach to the name of Christ. And to a certain degree, it can affect also the outreach of the church outside of these walls. So you ask yourself, how, how then can I apply Titus or Paul's words to my life if I'm not a pastor? How can I apply it to myself if I'm not part of, of the ministry? But all of us have a ministry. All of us, what is the ministry? It's ministry. All of us minister every single day. So how can I apply this? At times, we engage in conversations with individuals who in the past have expressed to me, they said, well, I wish my family could be saved. You ever heard people tell you that before? I wish my children would come to the knowledge of Christ. I wish my, my rowdy neighbor would accept Christ so he turned down that music. <laughs> We've all been through that. We've all heard people saying that before. But what has happened many times is that what is stopping those people, it's you. It's I. The way we conduct ourselves. And sometimes that's not done. Why isn't, why are my children being saved? Maybe, maybe I need to reflect on myself first before I try to get them saved. I got to think about the way I'm conducting myself before I expect them to cut conduct themselves according to the word of God. Now, many times we wonder why this is not happening, why various things are affecting us around, why people's lives are not being changed, why they're rejecting the message. For example, there was a young man who once asked, they asked him, why, why don't you serve God? And the young man responded, if God is like my father, who calls himself a Christian, I don't want anything to do with God. Listen to that. How sad is that situation? The first thing people see when they come to the knowledge of God many times is you and I. And this is why Paul was stressing the fact that these men that are going to be the, the, the local pastors, the elders, they have to exemplify a characteristic of integrity to such degree that even those that are not part of the gospel message or have accepted it can see a difference in him. People say today, well, if being a Christian is like everybody, you know, sometimes people call it, everybody throws the name Christian out today like anything else. Anybody, you ask somebody in the street, do you know God? Everybody will tell you they know God. Some people will even tell you they're Christians. But the character or the life or the testimony that they're given is contrary to the word of God. And then we ask ourselves why people are not coming to the knowledge of God. Many times it is because of the conduct of those that profess Christ as their Savior. And Paul is saying it clearly here. Now, what does he say? Listen to verse 7. For a bishop of the blameless. And then he says he has to be a steward. Of God. How important is it for us to remember that this is God's church? This is not our church. This don't belong to us. However, God has entrusted 
the church with the responsibility of managing the work here on earth. What an honor that Christ left us to manage his work. Therefore, we can once again emphasize the following scripture. Listen to what 1 Timothy 3 and 5 says. If a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Oh, man. They say, I, I bet if Paul was here today, he'd be hated by many Christians. And I bet they'd probably grab him and kick him out of the churches because he was straight and forward. He said, you cannot be a steward of God's house if you're not being a steward in your own home. And he's saying it right here. If a man that know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of God's church? So the elder, the bishop, the pastor, the overseer, they're all accountable to God in what they have been called to do. And so are you and I. It's very important. One very important thing that we must remember is that a steward, he doesn't own what he's asked to do, but he is a manager of something that he does not own. So the leadership or the pastors or the elders, they don't own God's church. It's God's church. They've been called to be good stewards of God's church. Now, he emphasizes that the church belongs to God and not man. So faithfulness is one of the most important qualities in the church. Not just for leadership, but for you and I. Faithfulness. Those who are appointed to be pastors or overseer or elders are entrusted with the responsibility of, listen to this, of caring for what they have been given and not to misuse it or doing so would not bring glory to God. We have a great responsibility. The pastor has a huge responsibility. The local leader has a huge responsibility. The worship leader has a huge responsibility. Why? Because everything that we do must at the end give God the glory. You have a huge responsibility. Paul emphasized that the responsibility not just fell on the leadership, but it also falls on us that are here. So now, how do I apply being a steward of God? How can I apply what Paul is telling Titus here? I believe that this principle applies not only to leaders in God's church, but it applies to all of us. The book of Titus is for everyone, regardless of our position. Each of us is a steward of something that God has entrusted us. For those that are mothers, it may mean your children. You're a steward of those children that God has placed in your hands. For those that are grandmothers, how many are grandmothers here? Your grandchildren, you are a steward of your grandchildren. God has entrusted those grandchildren in your hand. For grand, for, for, for uh, grandmothers and grandfathers, it, and it's crucial that we understand the importance of this responsibility. It's so important. When we do, we'll strive to do everything we do for the Lord the best of our abilities. You know, sometimes when we think of things of church, or the things that involve church service, we, we give only half of our heart to the word, but God is requiring anything. Do the best you can for God. I, I've shared this story so many times that uh, a, a brother who was an overseer in Chile, his daughter wanted to play the drums. She wanted an electrical drum set. And they found one like on a marketplace, like on Facebook, and they went to that area, and they come to find out it was the house of a recording of a music producer. This guy was a profession. And he sat down and he said, well, I have two drums. He goes, I have this one here that costs, let's say, $100, and this one here that costs 150 Now, the 150 is a professional. You're talking about the best drum set you can get. And he said, what are you buying this for? And he said, well, I'm a pastor. I'm buying it for my daughter. She wants to play. We're going to use it in church. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I, okay. So what, what should he want? He said, well, I'll get the $100. He said, that's what I don't like about you, Christian. Your pastor looked at me. Well, what do you need? He said, 
I recognize that I'm producing music for the devil. And I have the best of the best. But you gotta, you, you're producing music for God. You're going to take these drums in into God's house and you're telling me you're going to give them the cheapest one and not pay $50 more? You know what the pastor said? Give me the $150. <laughs> but he learned a lesson. And when he told me, I thought about it, I said, that's so true. We want to give God half-hearted work when God, he deserves all of it. Whole-hearted work. Then if we're going to do it, we're going to clean the restrooms in church. Clean it the best way you can. You're not doing it for the pastor. Who are you doing it for? For God. And the Titus it had all of a sudden Titus the same thing. I want men in leadership, he's telling him, that are gonna love God's church, that are gonna be stewards to manage God's church, manage the work of God, because at the end of the day, God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory. And that's what he's telling him. Now how do I apply that to my life? It's crucial that we understand this. That what we do, we will strive to do everything for the Lord to our best of our abilities. We should not be things half-heartedly for God, but rather with all our hearts, give it our best to Him. You know why? Because we're going to be accountable to God for everything we do. We're going to be accountable. And how we do it. And it's essential that we do everything for God with excellence. That when people say, you say, man, that is amazing what that local church is doing. You know why? Because they're doing it for God. But when you venture out to do things for your own glory, at the end of the day, it's going to get messed up. It will work. But when, it, when it's for God, it will prosper. And God will make it prosper. Now, he says, for a bishop must be blameless, verse 7, a steward of God. And then he says, not self will oh, listen to that what does that term self-will mean or where does it come from it comes from the greek word listen to this auto please so paul adds two greek words together and he says hey he shouldn't be an auto pleaser who is he pleasing himself so he's selling us here he's saying a bishop is blameless he's a steward of god and he must not be doing things to please himself. It refers to a person who is dominated by self-interest. Does that sound like 2023 or what? Self-interest. Listen to this. And is inconsiderate of others. So in other words, it's not about me, myself, and who? And I. And nobody else. Can you imagine if a pastor was functioning this way? Well, I've spoken to pastors then. They, they find it totally normal not to be in the worship service. Not to be in it. We well, say, well, where are you at? He said, I'm, not, I'm in the back office. And when the message comes, I come to the front, I preach, and then go back into the back office. And nobody else thinks, he said, that's my job. That's not your job. That's just 1% of your job. Huh? And so one time they, they asked his brother, he He's an evangelist, and he was walking in his town, and he was not preaching at that time, and he ran into one of his friends, and he said, how you doing, Mike? He said, uh, he said I'm struggling. He said, well, what's wrong? He said, well, I started pastoring a church down the street. He said, well, what's going on? He said, I just can't do it. Well, he said, well, who called you to preach? I mean, who called you to be the pastor? He said, well, I just, I saw that they needed a pastor. He said, well, God didn't call you. He said, no, he didn't. Well, they get away from me, because if God don't call you, it's going to go wrong. And he said, well, he said he had good intentions, but God didn't call him to be the pastor. And sometimes we want to get ahead of God and do things. And Paul is telling Titus, hey, look, he must not be self-willed. An individual arrogantly asserts their own will, seeking personal pleasure at the expense of others. That's the type of man that Paul told Titus to avoid. In leadership position. What further explanation do we require to understand that a leader should not be self-centered, but rather called to serve? Now, there are several types of different types of leadership. You look at John Maxwell and all these men that teach leadership, and they have a lot of good stuff. You get a lot of, there's a lot of good leadership books that I read, 
But there's one type of leadership to me personally that is the best. It's called servanthood leadership. And you know what's found in the Bible? In 1 Corinthians 9, I'm just going to read here, 1 Corinthians 9, 18 and 19. Again, Paul says this. Listen to what Paul says. What is my reward then? Paul says, what am I receiving? Verily that when I preach, I make the gospel of Christ without charge. Then he says, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free of all men, yet have I made myself, listen to what he says, servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Servanthood leadership. So how do we apply being, uh, how do we apply here when he says that he is not to be self-willed? The concept of not being self-willed to ourselves by examining it is to examine our motives and considering the impact of our actions. You know, a while back, we were publishing a book in Life Week called Marriage According to the Bible, and the author came, and he was talking about his book, and he said something that got me thinking. I said, wait a minute. He said, you know, as husbands, we do things self will sometimes. He said, I give you a good example. He said, the other day I was in my kitchen and I was washing the dishes. And in my mind, I was saying, I'm washing the dishes so Becky can see that I'm a good husband. He said, who was I doing it for, Becky or myself? And I said, oh, man, I got to stop washing the dishes for Bernice. <laughs> and do it work. He said, do it because you're, yeah, you're helping in the house. That's your duty. Don't do it because you want to just show off and tell her, look, I'm being a good husband washing the dishes. And I never thought about that. And Paul is saying here, he's saying, look, how do we apply this to ourselves? That instead of seeking personal pleasure or gain at the expense of others, we can strive to serve and consider the needs of those around us. So what is he saying here? A pastor is blameless, a bishop. He's a steward of God and manages God's, God's church correctly. He's not self-willed. In other words, he's looking of how he can serve others instead of others serving him. How can we serve that? Now, I like the next one. Are you, are you going with me? Listen to what verse 7 says. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed. Uh-oh, here's the next one. What does it say? Not soon angry. Uh-oh. Should I skip that one? Okay. What does that mean? Not soon angry. How many of us have gone angry before? Raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. Everybody. Oh, we've all gotten angry. It's normal. What does this mean? That we must not have a quick temper. Uh-oh. Now, we do know that according to Ephesians 4.26, that there is a righteous temper. I told we're talking Brother Dad right now about going to Cleveland and preaching. And said, I'm going to give it to us. And then bring a whip like Indiana Jones. But there is a righteous temper. And a good temper. But when it says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. But many times that anger someone has becomes unrighteous. Listen. And then it is directed towards you against other people. And sometimes we go through that. I've had to apologize to my wife many times. Because of another situation and it wasn't you know, taken out on her. But she ain't got nothing to do with it. And what does it say here? It's very clear what Paul is saying here. Many times the anger with someone has uh, is unrighteous and then is directed against other people. But God forgave us. And if we have found ourselves in this situation, God can forgive us. And we can make it right. What is the old American writer Will Rogers? Listen to what he said one time. He said, temper is such a wonderful thing that it's a shame to lose it. I have to look at that. Such a wonder, but it's a shame to lose it. In other words, it's okay to have strong emotions and express that. It's okay. Many of us are different. Hmm? 
As long as we don't let them get out of control and cause harm to others or ourselves and keep those emotions controlled by the guidance of the Holy Ghost. So what is Paul saying? That pastor better not get mad if somebody falls asleep in his preach and grab the Bible and throw it at him. You got to keep his temper now. Got to be, got to be considerate of the people. Now, I once heard a, a, a preacher talk about this, and he went up to his friend, and he, two preachers were talking, and he said, Hey, he said, Mike, are you sanctified, Mike? He's an old Pentecostal, Mike. Oh, I'm sanctified. I am it. Paula. John slapped him in the face. Mike turned around and slapped John back. John said, I thought you were sanctified. He said, I thought I was. Now, that's a good example of watching your temper. I don't know what I would have done in that situation. Mike thought he was, but he really wasn't sanctified. And what does Paul say? The leader must control this tip. Know how to deal with conflicts. How do I apply that to myself? Then I have to learn also to control this temper. I have to learn also to sometimes instead of saying something, close my mouth and leave it in God's hands and go to prayer and say, God, you know what? Help me, God. Then there's going to be situations where you can say, oh, here comes Mike again. Turn around, make sure he don't see us. You got to love him. I know it's hard, but with God's help, it's possible. And he's not just talking to the leadership of the local church. He's not just talking to the pastor, but he's saying if the pastor exemplifies this and he teaches the others, this is going to multiply. And guess what? It's going to be a wonderful church that is filled with people that are wanting to live for God. Our warnings. That's why it's so important to strive for self-control and seek the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, such things there is no law. Isn't that wonderful? Well, we can do that. Now, the next one. So he says, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self will, not soon angry, not giving to wine. Thank God there's, well, not out. Is there any Baptists here? I had a conversation with, with a man one time on, on this interpretation, but I'm going to give you what the Bible tells us here. Now listen to this. Not giving to wine. The Bible provides clear guidance on the consumption of wine or, uh, and alcoholic beverages. Listen to what Proverbs 20 verse 1 says. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Very clear. The book of Proverbs, particularly chapter 19 and 21, emphasizes the importance of wisdom in all aspects of our lives. Paul teaches, and he talks here in the Old Testament, and emphasizes that the church of God should not practice the drinking of alcoholic beverages. He warns that excessive drinking can lead to reaching bad temperament, poor judgment, qualities that are in direct conflict with the qualities of a bishop who should be blameless, a steward of God, meaning a good administrator, not self will or soon to anger. Now, some will argue today in our culture that this is part of the scripture that Paul is just saying that a bishop just must be careful and have good judgment. And they'll argue that and they'll give you these different interpretations. But argument here is not just that, but what it leads to. Where he, what, which here is what? The consumption of an alcoholic beverage. Well, some also argue and say that the Bible just says not to overdo it. If you are going to practice it. Yet I will argue today that the holiness stance that the church takes today is because of the stance of holiness that is found in the Bible of no consumption of alcohol in any form. The Bible tells us. Ephesians 5, 17 through 19 is a passage that we have just read. Therefore, do not be foolish, 
but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to the robbery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Listen to what it's saying here. So Paul is telling us the importance of being wise and understanding. He cautions against drunkenness, which can lead to immoral behavior instead of encourages believers to be filled with the Spirit. So when a person is drunk, what do they exhibit? A range of negative behaviors. We all know this, including impaired judgment, slurred speech, and loss of coordination. By contrast, being filled with the Spirit can lead to a positive behavior, such as speaking words of encouragement and praise to others and singing in heartfelt songs to the Lord. You see the opposites? Very clear. And that is what Paul desires for a pastor. And not just leadership, but for all of us that are professing holiness in our lives and living and trying to live for God one day at a time. For God. Next, and we'll end with this towards the end here. He says, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker. I'm not talking about soccer or football. He said, no striker. Paul here speaks of a person who is quarrelsome. And, and I, I want you to hear this. The term quarrelsome refers to a person who is prone to argue or pick fights with others right away. You ever met somebody like that? Anything you tell them right away, they just turn it around. I like your blue shoes. Well, why do you like my blue shoes today? Just complimenting you on your blue shoes. It's a quarrelsome person. They got other things going on that anything will trigger whatever's happened in the past. A quarrelsome person may be easily provoked, defensive, argumentative, and may engage in verbal or listen to this, or even physical altercations with others. Never should an elder or a leader act in such a way. But not just then. You would not. This applies to all of us. They may have difficulty controlling their emotions and may escalate conflicts unnecessarily. A quarrelsome person may be perceived as difficult to get along with. Oh, I've had a lot of those. You've ever had people that have been difficult to get along with? Or maybe you were the difficult one. That's hard to accept, right? Well, before I got saved, I was difficult to be with. Well, maybe you still are difficult to <laughs> And their behavior can create tension and conflict in relationships. Listen to a part. Man, it's not just being called to be a pastor and you're a pastor and that's it. No, man. There are qualifications for pastoring. This is a this is a great responsibility. This is more than I've ever said when, when I interviewed for the Museum of the Bible. If they would have told me all this, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. This is way more than that. There's some stuff here, and, and you have you and many of us have encountered an individual with such behavior. And perhaps before accepting Christ, like I said, we acted in this manner. But regardless, all presents a compelling argument. Once again. Paul establishes to Titus, this is the type of man that you are to choose to lead God's church. Can you imagine? And you know what? Titus found, found those men. And then what, what does that tell us? That though many times church leadership has failed us, though many times we have been hurt by the church, God has good men today. And God has good women today also that are men and women of prayer, of integrity, that want to do things right for God. And God at his time will raise them up. So the church of God should provide leaders that strive to live a whole life, serving as an example for others, and promoting the love of Christ within the church. And Paul recognizes that a striker could cause more harm than good as a pastor. And he tells us this. And the last one, verse said, not giving to filthy look. What does this mean? You saw, we saw this, we read it in chapter one. It means to me, greedy. Can't have a greedy pastor. Can't have greedy leadership. 
And we've seen that so many times and so many people have been hurt by this, that some people lose faith in the church. And they say, I don't want nothing to do with God, but all they do is take your money. You heard that before? It is. And Paul is telling us here, look, man, this is the man that you should choose, Titus, and they should not be lovers of this. The Bible condemns greed and warns believers of its destructive nature. Greed is a sin that can lead to spiritual and moral decay, and it often involves an excessive and uncontrolled desire for wealth or possessions that can lead to selfishness, dishonesty, and exploitation of others. And as Christians, and I'll end with this, it's important to remember that our possessions and our wealth is only temporary. I remember a few years ago, my uncle Richard, he was a Korean War vet. And I sat down with him two weeks before his passing, and I interviewed him, and he talked about his life, amazing life. Went went through that valley of death in the Korean War. A lot of men died, and he survived. And he came back, and he's in California. He's one of the first to have a nice house in the California area there. And he talked about all of this. And the one thing I remember, that the day that he passed, I remember going to the home. He passed that home. And I went and I saw his body, and it just hit me that he took nothing with him. Not even the clothes on his back. He left it all behind. And, I, and at that moment, I said, nothing in this world, man, of my soul being ready to meet the Savior. Everything you have will stay behind. That nice car you drive all the time, you think you look cool drive, that's going to stay behind. That nice house you walk, you say, oh, this is a bit, that's going to stay behind. And, and those nice shoes you've been walking, all that is going to stay behind. I'm not saying to have those nice things. What I'm saying is that's not the priority. And it should not be the priority. And Paul is telling Titus, when you have pastors that are men of God, that are searching after God's heart, these men will love the soul more than anything else, will not desire this world because they know that everything is going to stay behind. But they want that soul to make heaven their home one day. And I saw my uncle, and I said, he left everything behind. And you know what happened? And all his kids fighting over his property. He's out there enjoying heaven. He, le he left it all behind. That's the mindset that Paul was trying to say. Because when the pastor has that mindset, when the leader has that mindset, when you have that mindset, it don't matter what happens in this world, you're sticking with Jesus. You're walking with Jesus. You're staying on the path with Jesus. It don't matter what happens. They can all fall behind you on the side of me, but I'm staying fixed on Jesus. That's what Paul is saying. And when you got a pastor or a leader or a person that is walking this way, God is leading. That's what Paul was trying to say. You look at these, well, these are a lot of requirements. No, when you really love God, these don't become requirements. These become stepping stones to get you closer to heaven, to get you closer to God. I want you to rise with us.